Hello and welcome to a series of videos on JBoss EAP7 migration. Uh, my name is Brian Edel. I work for a company called C2B2, who are uh, independent middleware consultants. Um, this series will provide a high level view into what to do if you're thinking of migrating uh, to JBoss EAP7, um, what standing for why, how, the action you'll take, and then what happens after that. In this particular video, we're looking at the drivers behind the migration. To start with, let's have a look at why we might want to migrate our current JBoss EAP to the new version EAP7. Um, and from my point of view, this kind of falls into three categories. Uh, the first category would be if your company has uh, a lifecycle management policy. And this kind of thing can be if uh, there might be a support requirement so that you're always fulfilling an enterprise support. Uh, there might be a licensing requirement that you're, you're under uh, the normal licenses rather than any other extended licenses. Uh, and there may just be a policy of having to be on a release which is uh, a couple behind the current release out there. Uh, just for stability factors. Um, and this is all really just to reduce the risk of uh, the application and the stability of the application and the supportability of it. Um, the other category uh, is technology. Um, the technology you use will obviously be part of a solution uh, and that may be driven by other external projects or other factors. Um, you might want to uh, remain operable within these and be on a version which is fully tested and supported with all the interfaces surrounding it. You might find, for example, that one of your dependent technologies, such as Oracle, is managed by a different team um, and they have their own lifecycle management plan, which means they need to upgrade their version for their own reasons, whether it be uh, for licensing or uh, support, uh, and you need to be compatible with those. Um, and then we have the third uh, high level contention, which is the, the opportunity. Uh, if you're moving on to modern new technology, then of course you're gonna get the opportunities that arise with that, with any new features that may come out of that, um, any enhancements you can make to your own coding because you have the facility to do that. You might be able to streamline your design. Uh, this might make it easier to monitor, to be stable, to be more performant. Um, and in this fast moving world, you'll be able to better respond to your users' requirements. So I think it really does depend on, on your policies. Um, I think sensibly, if you're in the vein of a couple of uh, versions behind, I think that you'll be fine. I wouldn't want to be too old in your versions, uh, just because the world is moving apace at the moment. So this slide is just giving you like a life cycle management um, platform life cycle, where on here you can see that there's four categories here, uh, Red Hat uh, OS, the Microsoft platform, uh, JBoss and Java. And you can kind of see on here um, what level they are at in their different versions in terms of life, in terms of support and extended support. Um, and one thing that you can do with the lifecycle management is you can kind of earmark and target certain release structures uh, on your year. So here I've got a couple of instances, the middle of 2017, middle of 2018, and for those you could target a certain uh, application set. So it might be sensible, for example, in 2018, middle of that year, if you're looking at a stable, supportable, operable situation, then if you've got a a, a Linux uh, platform, then it might be sensible to go for RHEL 7 um, sitting with JBoss EAP 7 and uh, we're using Java 8. Um, that is in the middle of fully supported infrastructure sensible move. Um, middle of 2019 moving forward, things may change slightly. So this is an ongoing update to this life cycle as you should move forward. And we'll carry on with our next slide, which is the dependencies. And this is a, 
a key slide really in terms of working with all the other areas that you might work with in your business. Um, EAP7 uses all the modern technology, so it's on RHEL 7, um, it needs uh, Java 1.8, um, and all the most recent uh, technologies. And it's always sensible to be on a configuration that is commonly used and fully tested. Uh, as you know, Red Hat has its supported configuration sheet, and it's sensible to be on one of those those supported configurations, not only because Red Hat can support it uh, better, but also because the community will be more likely to have one of those supported com configurations and therefore you'll get better support from there as well. And of course, with the opportunity side, we have the new features. Um, with the AP7, it brings you JEE7 and uh, Java 1.8. Uh, which does bring multiple updates and changes. Um, some of the components that have changed within JBoss, uh, you can see there, whereas the JBoss web has moved to Undertow, the Hornet Q has moved to Active MQ Artemis, um, JBoss AS has moved to the Wildfly Core, and there's various things that have been removed and added. Um, and of course, with the updated JEE and also the updated Java, there's a whole bunch of things that have uh, been upgraded and modified that you might be able to take advantage of in your application and it may be something that um, the developers may be keen uh, to utilize uh, for not only their own interest but also to ensure that the application is remaining performant and can also respond to users demands and uh, have new features in when they need to have new features so we quickly went through there some drivers behind the migration um, and I boiled those down into three different areas with the lifecycle management, um, with the technology, with the dependencies and the interfaces which that use, and also the opportunity for uh, migrating to a new technology stack. Um, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Next time we'll look through the development challenges, how we do that. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you.